Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're talking about trashing food after we pay to produce it with special, <laughs> special guests, Leah Lizanardo, co-founder and CEO at 412 Rescue Incorporated in Pennsylvania, Carol Shattuck, CEO of Food Rescue U.S. in Connecticut, Arlen Preblood, founder and, and executive director of We Won't Waste Incorporated in Colorado, and Beth Smith, president and CEO of Saving Grace Perishable Food Rescue in Nebraska. So thank you all for joining us. This is such an important topic, and I said in the preamble that we can all do a little bit to help this, this, uh, this issue. We can actually change from wasting 40% of what we produce in this land of plenty and, and help our neighbors in the process. So, Leah, let's start with you. What prompted you to co-found um, this uh, organization? And tell us a little bit about what 412 uh, does in Pennsylvania. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, it's 412 Food Rescue. It's um, named after our area code here in Pittsburgh when we started. Um, and what prompted me really to, um, you know, co-found this organization is, um, like you said, it's it's all the surplus in, in the land of plenty. I am an immigrant. I immigrated um, uh, in my adulthood, a first generation immigrant. And when um, I was growing up in the Philippines, you know, I would see, of course, all of the movies and all of the articles and beautiful pictures of of um, America. Right. And so um, I've always wanted to, um, you know, understand how it is to live in a country that is so different from where I grew up. And so when I moved to New York City, you know, it was everything it was, um, of course, that I've read about and seen. But also, you know, on the other side of that, you know, seeing that in, you know, this this developed country, this, you know, so-called first world nation, there's actually two worlds, you know, and it's the the other one is quite hidden. Um, um, and, and that's really what prompted me to, you know, co-found this organization when I saw that in the face of so much surplus, you know, there's also so much need. And, and it's very obvious in New York, right? You have these huge logistic chains to move um, food, fresh food in particular, into this land of concrete, right? And then you, you then later on see so much of it thrown away um, in, in, in refuse. Um, Carol, what prompts you to be working on food rescue in Connecticut? So our founders in 2011 came to the belief that there could be a technology solution to all the surplus and all the need. And by connecting food donors and social service agencies that feed the food insecure, uh, they'd be able to get at the two crises these two serious crises, food waste and food insecurity. So they created one of the first, if not the first apps in the food recovery space to do just that. But they started small and you know we've grown very, very significantly over the years. But me personally, I actually grew up living all over the world. So like uh, Leah, I saw a lot uh, in a number of countries uh, where there was so much need. And then you come back to our country and there's so much need here when there are 40 million plus people now who are food insecure. So for me, it's just such a basic need. You can't survive without food and you can't survive well without healthy, nutritious food. And Arlen, you in the center of the country, you know, nobody thinks of Colorado as a place where um, uh, food is wasted, nor where there, there is that need. But that's that actually belies the reality, doesn't it? It certainly does. And I started this back in 2008 when we were in the recession and I had practiced law for a good number of years prior to that. And I didn't want to fight that recession in the practice of law, but I wanted to do something else. So I hung up my shield and I, I began to look. And as a foodie, my wife and I were out many nights at restaurants and I began to talk to people that owned them and the chefs. And I said, what do you do with the food at the end of the night that you don't sell? You know, you have three pans of lasagna that didn't make it out. And they generally said that they had to throw it away because they had not found a way that they could distribute it. And I talked over a period of months. I said, well, 
if I could take this food from you and distribute it to nonprofit agencies, would you donate it? And they absolutely said yes, because as all of us know, chefs and cooks hate to throw food away. I then went back to the agencies that I had volunteered at, and they were struggling as well because money was drying up. They still had to support their clients. I said, if I could deliver food to you that was fresh and wholesome, would you take it? And they overwhelmingly said yes. So that began about a six-month process where I put together a plan, uh, looked at all what I thought would be barriers to doing this. And finally, in September of 2009, I uh, put down the seats of my Volvo station wagon, got a tarp, and start calling on caterers because caterers, as you know, are having an event for 250 people. They produce for 275. And unfortunately, for whatever reason, all 250 don't show up and they have all this excess food. So I prevailed upon them to take it back to their commissaries, pan it in aluminum foils, cover it, label it, and put it in their coolers and call me. And that's how we started back in 2009. And now here we are in 2022. Uh, we have four refrigerated trucks. We have an 11,500 square foot distribution center with uh, cooler space and frozen food space. And we're the largest independent food recovery in the state of Colorado. And there's plenty of food, Mark, that goes wasted even now in Colorado. So we're not anywhere in the point of solving this problem. And Beth, this, this story isn't unfamiliar to you. You live in the land of plenty, right? You live in a place where uh, Nebraska is, is famous for, um, for agriculture, uh, for um, not being particularly densely populated, but the need is there as intense as in New York, right? I mean, it's, it, it's just everywhere, isn't it? Right, it is. And I come from a background in the travel industry. So I've been blessed to travel the world and seeing some of our even third world countries. And then um, uh, and then I was in uh, also uh, other nonprofits that kind of worked with the inner city and saw about the haves and the have nots, right. which depending on the s scope, you know, they're always are. And I realized early on that we don't have a food production problem. We have uh, an equitable food distribution problem. And what can we do for that? Um, too many times with the not getting into the nonprofit from the for-profit business, um, I always would hear, oh, we're just a nonprofit. So I was very succinct when I started this in 2013 that we are a nonprofit business providing a charitable service to our community by what we do. Because... Um, we would love to get into more uh, with volunteers. We have people that would like to volunteer, but I started this out beca because we had such pushback. Oh, we can't do it. It's illegal. We'll get sued. All those things that no one's ever, ever been sued for donating food anywhere. So anybody ever has any of that, but there has not been, you know, we have the Good Samaritan Act that covers that anyway. But I just said that once we get food donors on board, it's recruiting food donors you know, that it's safe, that we have, um, I started with one refrigerated truck, same as Arlen, um, and a professional driver with a food handling license, they get the food safety license. And then, um, and it's not mandatory here, just wanted to do that. And then we uh, have grow out, pick up the food and we redistribute it same day. We started with three food donors. We were taken to three pantries. We now have over 70 food donor locations. And we're taking it to over 40 some nonprofits, uh, charity, yeah, different types of nonprofits. And um, we do not warehouse a thing. As soon as we get it, they get it. That's why we're basically a distribution and logistics operation. Your, trans, your transshipment point. And, and I think that your point about it being a business is so important. If you take a look at what you've all done and what, your, what other organizations around the country have done, there are a couple of themes here. First of all, that business point that you made, Beth, is, is, is so very important. Secondly, we're all powerful. It's just a matter of getting up off of our butts and starting off with, with, with a Volvo um, or some other uh, vehicle or a cart, right? It's, it's just figuring out how to, how to pull things together. And then there's also the creativity that's involved, right? We have, it's how we define the problem. It's not just about food, it's about logistics. It's about 
information. It's about sharing. It's about communicating. It's about community building. There are all these different aspects to this, a very sophisticated uh, series of problems. But I want to ask you all a, a really essential uh, question. Why do we have this problem in the first place? Why do we have, you characterized it, uh, Beth, as, uh, as having seen uh, third world, and you, Leia, talked about uh, growing up in the Philippines where you see uh, poverty and wealth very close together. We have the exact same thing. It's just so often it's invisible unless we have uh, homeless camps uh, uh, across from uh, major buildings. Why do we have this problem? Why are we one of the best, most efficient agricultural um, uh, countries in the world, yet so much is uh, goes to waste? Uh, Arlen, could you could you give us your, your take and then we'll go to uh, Carol? Sure, I think there are a couple of reasons for that. And uh, one is that farmers are paid to produce and we have a uh, insufficient food chain logistics problem. And not paid that much to produce, by the way. No, they're not, but they still are, are paid. Now they produce the product, but then when you get it to the, the grocery store, for instance, and I'll give you a perfect example. Let's talk about bell peppers. Bell peppers come in basically three colors, red, yellow, and green. Bell peppers also have chambers and they have four chambers. Some grow with three chambers, but the grocery store says, we will only accept four chamber bell peppers. We will only accept green bell peppers with no yellow or red bell peppers with no red. Those that have red, those that have three chamber, we, have, we work with a, a distributor, landfill. Well, until we got to that point, we used to, uh, they would throw away all those good bell peppers because well, they I, I, when I make gumbo, I do examine the little cut up pieces of pepper to see whether it came from a. Well, but, well, I want you not only to examine them, Mark, I want you to taste a three chamber bell pepper and a four chamber bell pepper. They taste the same. The same, same thing is true about the crooked carrot, a crooked carrot cut up tastes the same as a straight carrot, but the end users, you and I and the people that shop at the grocery stores, they look at a crooked bell pepper or a off color bell pepper and they won't buy it. It's the same thing you and I talked about by the three sell by, use by and best buy. Those are fictitious. Those are marketing ploys that enable grocery stores to push upon the general public. You need to buy this with five days left, not three days. Well, the, the wholesaler that has product that has three days left the grocery stores won't take that. We get that and we distribute it to other people. So there are just several examples of why we have this excess product line. Carol, what's your take on this? And I, I love the idea that you were founded by uh, people out of the inf information industry because it's a totally different cut uh, on this. What's, what's your take? Is there, is there an information deficit and an education deficit that we all suffer from that, that, that has this, this effect? Are there, or are there other elements that explain this? So I think, first of all, in America, we're used to plenty. We're a, we're a food, cult, food culture of plenty. We like variety. We like to have choices. The manufacturers you know, give us more choices than we could possibly ever you know, get or wrap our head around. So we're accustomed to that on the one hand. And then speaking a bit to what Arlen just said, we also expect quality. And I think the grocery stores also expect to put out quality. So there are a lot of blemishes that, you know, and that might be in a green pepper or in an apple and orange that gets taken off the shelf. They turn their, their produce and their vegetables very frequently. So I think, you know, that creates a tremendous amount of opportunity for us to go in and rescue that food and deliver it. But I think also, and I think somebody mentioned this before, for major events, they can't run out of food. Back in 2020, we rescued over 40,000 pounds of, of food that wasn't consumed at the Super Bowl at Hard Rock Stadium in Miami. Wow. And there's no way they could run out of food for any of their customers at the Super Bowl. And uh, so we did um, an awful lot of good with it at that time. So I think it's it's some of it is customer driven, but I think some of it is also the the food producers and giving us so much choice. And I, I just want to add one of our founders is a pastor and the other was uh, in, is a developer, software developer. So they brought the 
you know, the head and the heart together. Well, how do you see it? You know, it's it's interesting when you take a look at, at America uh, from different perspectives. And it just seems to me that that you have a unique perspective having come to this country, adopted it, operated within it, but having also grown up in a different place and, and have family in a different place. How is America seen in this respect? Um, it's so this is not just an American problem. This is a developed country problem. And then in developing countries, it's, you know, the food happen, the food waste, the food loss happens earlier in the supply chain because they don't have the technology that we have um, in terms of refrigeration to actually preserve food, you know, um, well enough to actually reach um, the consumer. So, um, so this is, uh, you know, agreeing with Carol and Arlen, you know, the causes of it is a lot of it is, you know, the cosmetic standards that we have, you know, in the same way that we have beauty standards um, that are propagated by, you know, magazines and advertising. We have the same problem with food. You know, when you see an ad for a carrot or when you see an ad for an apple, it's this beautiful apple, this beautiful carrot. Um, <laughs> and people never get, you know, the last bunch of kale. There has to be a lot of kale. If there's two bunches of kale in that shelf, people will think something's wrong with it, that it's unwanted. So those are, you know, and then the date labeling standards are, are um, completely confusing um, in, in, in our country. So, um, but then again, on the other side of that, you know, when we have gathered all of this food and when we know that all of this food exists, this food has no value, you know, to many people. Um, and the people who would put value in it, you know, certainly can't get get it right you know there's no way for them to go to the grocery store to take surplus for free or even for a discounted price so the problem then becomes a logistics problem how do you get this food with zero value nearly zero value to all of the people who need it so your transport your logistics cost should be nearly zero as well and so that's where technology and, you know, um, that's model, which is the same as ours. We have trucks, we have no warehouses, we distribute on the same day. And our technology connects, you know, the sources of food, grocery stores, sports arenas, um, universities, offices, to um, nonprofits that need it. And then we, you know, we mobilize a DoorDash type driver network um, that then takes the food from one place to the other for free because they're volunteers. And so, you know, then you then you realize, you know, that you can pick up pallets of food using trucks, you know, which is one side of the supply chain and then smaller quantities of food using cars, which is what this this new commercial delivery service industry is all about. Right. And so then you solve the logistics issue and the logistics cost of moving all of this food. And that's when you start understanding that, OK, this is we need many different ways to tackle food waste and um, you have to intervene in all stages of the supply chain. So educating consumers on dates and that, you know, the, that tree demand for that three chambered bell pepper and tell your grocery store that you will buy that. I love I love what you're all saying, because in many respects, you're each saying a similar theme. And it's that to, to discard preconceptions Lair, you just said, you know, let's use the ideas that we're seeing um, in companies like Uber, DoorDash, those kinds of to, to create a scaled logistics. Uh, Arlen, you're an attorney, yet you're now a food delivery and uh, logistics uh, person. You have a growing and logistics problem that gets redefined as an information problem in your um, uh, organization, Carol. Uh, you, Beth, decide to just get some trucks and and you start seeing need and you see. But you're you're basically focusing on societal outcomes and you're working your way back to solutions. Is there something else that we could be doing systemically in the United States to reduce this investment? In waste, because if if forty percent of what is grown is wasted, then forty percent of the money that goes into agriculture is being burnt with a match. Anyone want to want to uh, weigh in here um, on on this issue? I, I have a point to make here, so that we're not solely looking at the growing end and the distribution end of this problem. There are 
five different areas that we look at. We look at households, grocery stores, restaurants, farms, and transportation. And all of, by the way, two thirds of the people who responded to our polls uh, said that they actually personally, their households do waste. Do you know what percentage in those five areas is the leader of food waste? Household. Yeah. Households, 43% of the food that's wasted is generated in households. So you mentioned, Mark, buy what you need and use what you buy. And that's a concept that unfortunately, too many Americans and too many people in this country just never, never look at. Maybe we've been spoiled by our refrigerators. You know, Leah, you made a great point that, that in less developed countries, the uh, food waste is invisible because it never makes it out of the fields, right? because we don't have the refrigeration and sophisticated logistics, maybe we're cursed by our prosperity bath and, and we've just become so accustomed to sticking something in a refrigerator and forgetting it. Well, and I think well, a lot of, uh, of my friends here have brought it up, but uh, Leah did that. I had circled here real big to bring up valuing food. How much do we value the food that we have? And I think uh, another point that was brought up about uh, the labeling, which is such a big thing. And so we not only have our operations, which we have five vehicles going out daily, but we have a uh, food for thought to bring education and awareness about food waste and hunger, right? So that's a big part to have this no food waste movement is what we were doing. But um, a big part of it is a lot of, uh, especially in a lot of people, especially in the United States have been buying what they were selling in the food industry about those dates, those labeling dates. And so especially a lot of younger people have come into their mother's refrigerators and said, mom, this is so old and let's throw it out because it's kind of, oh, it's close to this date and stuff. You know, kind of got away from the taste and sniff test, right? right. Um, and I think other than baby formula, most of those things are not, none of those are mandated. It is a marketing ploy. And so just all of us getting out there and putting this out there, letting them know this a lot more, uh, it, it will really help it. The other thing that I'm just, we've been trying to do, and one of my board members brought this up, because we're all talking about food, um, food waste. Mm -hmm. It's the narrative of wasted food or food waste. We capture wasted food. Food waste, we work with our partners about composting because either way, what's edible and what isn't edible and kind of putting out this whole narrative out there because um, there is a big difference in the two. We do not transport trash, but none of it should be going in our landfill. Because everybody thinks that, you know, hey, this head of lettuce goes into a landfill. Do you know how long that could take to decompose? It could take up to 20 years and it's sending off methane gas. So, you know, we're all into, I think we're going to really start with our nourishing people and nourishing the planet by what we're doing with this. I can also talk a little bit about the connection with packaging, right? We, we're, we're very sensitive today to pollution and so on. And with, um, for example, when we when we throw away yogurt, when we throw away milk, there's a carton. There's a there, there's packaging that goes uh, in with that. And so, by reducing food waste, we're actually also uh, reducing our environmental uh, footprint. Arlen, you wanted to say something? Well, take the example of a household, two people, and one decides let's have steak for dinner tonight. So they go to the grocery store, and they look in the meat department, and they pick out a package. It contains three steaks. They take those home. They cook two. The third steak they wrap up and put into the freezer and don't think about it. Get Off about they it. go. Two weeks later, the other party says, well, let's have steak again. And what happens is they go to the store. They buy a package of three more steaks. They eat two. Now they have two in the refrigerator, never thinking to take those and put those uh, right. to use. So there's the waste there and the packaging that you talk about now. It's the curse. It's the curse of prosperity. We're, we're asking a question. I'd like to have your answer to this. Uh, the question that we're asking right now is should America freely distribute the large amount of food that would otherwise be wasted? There's an issue there. Are 
economic system that's grown up around agriculture is really about figuring out how to sell each product at the highest possible price. So the prettiest vegetable, the prettiest bell pepper with four chambers, without any hint of another color in it, um, is going to sell at the highest possible price. And at a certain point, when the price can't be achieved, that's moved into waste. Um, and so 40% of this has to do with how we actually sell food, how that economic system works. How do we change that in a way that that preserves what is good about that system um, while eliminating some of the downstream harmful effects with 40% uh, uh, food waste? I mean, we can talk about our personal activities, but there's also a systemic issue in terms of how and it's, it, it ties back to what you said, uh, uh, Arlen, in terms of, of how we market, sell, distribute the, the whole uh, sales chain. Carol, since you're in, in part in the information business, how do, we de- how do we deal with that? Well, I think as Beth was saying, it really comes down to how we value food. And it also comes down to how we value uh, the individuals in our communities who are food insecure. And I think for one, and I want to say, I think you have to become more planful in how we as consumers uh, buy food, what we're buying so that we're not overbuying. And I think I think it would be helpful if the grocery stores perhaps uh, give us fewer choices along the way. But I think uh, there are just too many people who have too much need and we have to connect uh, all this excess to them. And that's what we all are doing. Is a lot of this just about us individually being more thoughtful? I, I think that's and a lot of it. Making personal choices. Land, Absolutely. You think that, that that's part of it is that we just really need to, to just sort of think a little bit. Well, I think that's one of the reasons. And it's, and it's, you know, I kind of, as a, as a previous, you know, marketer, I used to work in consumer goods. You know, it's, it's, it's a chicken or egg question here. You know, we have been conditioned, you right. know, to want these things. You know, before I worked in food waste, it's, I, would, I was one of those that reached in the back of the milk, um, the milk shelf, you know, and, and get the ones that I thought was um, going to expire later. Um, and so it's, it's a lot about being conditioned throughout many years, you know, to desire these things. Um, and it will take a lot to move that. You know, there was a campaign by um, the Ad Council um, a few years ago, you know, Save the Food, where it's, you know, it started to kind of this, this what I call deep programming. But it's, it's not quite so easy. Um, and so, you know, in the meantime, we have to do something about, you know, the food that is going to waste. I mean, it's and just, you know, the education that is required to do this, you know, just think about recycling. You know, we've been trying to educate on recycling for so long and the numbers are astounding. It's, we're still in the single digits, really. So it's hard to move habits that have been inculcated for so long. And, you know, we have to tackle it from many different directions. I think there's also a dose of common sense. Jellen Walker uh, just contributed a question and we'll close on that. She said, how, how would somebody who has an event and has ends up with two lasagna pans of food Right. And they go to the local shelter and the shelter says, well, we can't accept that because we don't know. We don't know where where it's been. We don't know if it's any good or whatever. And obviously it was just it, it was just supplied. It was just used that evening. You're bringing it to, to a shelter. I think that there's a lot about personal responsibility, common sense, trying to do the right thing um, that that is part of this. And you've all uh, you've all done that and, and your teams have done that in your own way. I'd just like to thank you all, Leah Lizarondo, co-founder and CEO of 412 Rescue Incorporated in Pennsylvania, Carol Shattuck, CEO of Food Rescue US in Connecticut, Arlen Preblood, founder and, and executive director of We Don't Waste Incorporated in Colorado, and Beth uh, Ostick smith uh, president and CEO of Saving Grace Perishable Food Rescue in Nebraska. You've all really helped us to understand this issue. Thank you so much. Thank your people. Thank your professionals. Thank your board members, your funders for the great work that you do and stay safe.
Thank you for the opportunity, Mark. Yes, thank you.